Well, good morning and welcome. Hey, Vicar, good to see you. Um, good to see all of you this morning. You survived the winter blast. And uh, I had no idea, for example, Pete owns a long sleeve shirt. I didn't know that. Uh, I, I have socks, Miss Eleanor, that have F-22s on them. Yep, I found those this morning. That was kind of fun. Uh, so, yeah, it's just exciting. Heather says, uh, please, uh, please give thanks for the cold. Uh, she said that all of you Keys people get to have warm weather 362 days out of the year. She gets cool weather three days. So just please be gracious with her and give thanks uh, for the cool weather. <laughs> yeah, that's fun. That's fun. All right, this week is... Uh, Mm, the last week of January, first week of February, which means uh, there's a new table talk on the back. Uh, if you like to use that for your daily devotions, uh, plus some extra articles, I think this month's topic is uh, uh, having to do with Jewish life. So if you're interested in that, uh, there'll be some extra articles in addition to the daily devotions in the table talk on both tables in the back. Next week will be the first week of the month, which we will have a... Uh, We'll observe the Lord's Supper during worship, and we'll have a first Sunday fellowship. And uh, depending upon the weather, uh, Jay, maybe we'll we'll think about having it outside if it's uh, up in the mid 70s or something. A nice uh, nice keys day, but if it's like today, we'll have it inside. <laughs> we'll we'll play that one by ear. Uh, but uh, bring something if you if you can, and if you can't, come and eat something. I would love to have you there. Last week, um, pa Pastor Craig had an unexcused absence. Again, uh, I didn't approve it. I don't know who did, but he was he wasn't here. So uh, we we tried something out of the ordinary, and we did uh, three worship songs uh, via YouTube. And I asked for your feedback, and I got several positive responses from that. And uh, Pastor Craig and Pastor Steve and I have been talking about music ministry and we're excited to continue to try to expand our uh, live in-person uh, music ministry but overarching goal for music remember this entire service is a worship service uh, we worship through singing we worship through giving we worship through fellowship we worship through praying we worship through preaching and the music is one aspect of that. And during corporate worship, our aim is to enhance the congregational singing. Uh, we are all here to worship together, and we want to do whatever we can to enhance that, to make it easier for you as the individual person to worship in spirit and truth. And of course, if we had a full orchestra of professionally gifted musicians, then that probably is at the top of the list of people's preferences. Um, but that's not where we are. We're at a different level of uh, what the Lord has gifted us with in our small congregation. But we're going to continue to work with that. We want to develop people who have an interest in music ministry and giftedness in that. So we're going to continue to do whatever we can with whomever the Lord sends us. And so we'll continue to do that like we have throughout the uh, years. But we're thinking about mixing it up a little bit and and intermixing some of like what we did last week we're going to do it again this week and we're not going to do it every week but we are going to try to mix it up just a little bit because we know if there's one area that people have differing opinions and preferences it's music and so uh, be gracious with one another some weeks you may enjoy it more than other weeks but remember on the week that you're not enjoying it it probably means somebody else's that's their favorite week and so um, we'll just continue to explore options with the aim of enhancing our congregational singing um, if the the more People sing around me, the more it helps me to be in the right frame of mind for worship. And so um, we're going to do that again this week. And so uh, music minister Greg, as I dubbed him last week, is going to uh, have the YouTube. And is that what we're going straight into now from this? Thank you. 
Thank you. I need all the help I can get. Uh, I remembered I, I don't have a call to worship because Sky's going to do a scripture reading now that'll be our call to worship. And then uh, we'll go into uh, singing like we did last week. So Sky, I'll give the microphone over to you for our scripture reading slash call to worship. Thanks for doing that. This is out of Psalms 103. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your, dis your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy who satisfies you with good so that you so that your youth is renewed like the eagles the lord works righteousness and justice and all who are oppressed he he made known his ways to moses his acts of for the people of israel the lord is merciful and gracious slow to anger abounding in steadfast love he will not always ch chide nor will he keep his anger forever he does not deal with us according to our sins nor repay us for according to our iniquities for as high as the heavens and are above the earth so great is his steadfast love towards those who hear him as far as the east is from the west, so far, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower for the, of the field. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and, is, and his righteousness to children, to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of the word. Bless the Lord of all his host, his ministers who do, this, do his will. Bless the Lord all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Thank you.
Praise the Lord. You may be seated as we come to a time of worship through giving. And I think about 10,000 reasons why I am drawn to worship the Lord. One of the things that I think about is all that he has given to us. And I was reminded of the Old Testament passage, Malachi chapter 3, how the people of God were not bringing to the house of God, the things that God had called them to bring uh, in the Old Testament ties. Now, in the New Testament, we're called to um, take all that we have and view it as belonging to God. And so our prayer each week, each paycheck is, Lord, what do you desire for me to give to your work for your kingdom? Um, And so the principle, though, is similar as God is speaking to them. He says in verse 10, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. And so the principle is we as humans tend to hold on tightly to things that we that we think we need and certainly finances are one of those and we think ah, I don't have enough to give to God's work because I need this to pay my rent to buy groceries to pay the power bill whatever but God says ah, don't don't live life like that don't live life thinking that you serve a God who has limited resources God knows our every need before we even have it and he says part of your worship is giving and remember Jesus looked at the widow's might and said you know she gave more than anybody so it's not the the amount of money you're giving it's it's your heart it's your surrender to the lord that everything belongs to the lord and praying lord what would you have our family give to your work and uh, it will be different for each family and so whatever the lord puts on your heart then just worship him in that way there's an offering plate in the front and in the back god as we think about these principles that you call us to give towards your eternal kingdom we pray that whatever you lay on your people's hearts that you would take that money and that you would apply it to the work of this church for the eternal kingdom that we would be good stewards of it that you would multiply Apply it and bless it that souls would be saved and saints would be sanctified. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. He hears us and uh, will answer us according to his perfect plan for his glory and for our good. So let's join our hearts together and pray again. Father, we worship you through prayer. It is our heartfelt position that we bow before you, recognizing our place, that we are the created, that you are our creator. And then in Christ, you have instructed us that we are not our own. We've been bought with a price and we are called to glorify you in our body and our spirit, which are yours. And so we are described in the New Testament as your slaves, as your bondservants. And so 
in an attitude of humility, we approach your throne of grace this morning. And we are so thankful that you are our master. As we consider your characteristics, that you are holy and just in righteousness, you are full of grace, giving us what we don't deserve. You are full of mercy, not giving us what we do deserve. And we recognize that we all once walked in the flesh, fulfilling our desires of sin and rebellion against you, but you, to the praise of your glorious grace, have redeemed us and reconciled us and named us your own. We are your children through the work, redeeming power of your Holy Spirit and the work of Christ on the cross. And so we worship you with thanksgiving in our hearts, just taking in this moment, the fact that we've been born again to a living hope, that as we have requests on our heart and mind because the circumstances of our life are difficult, but we are looking forward to a home in heaven one day soon where we will be with you and there will be no more sorrow, no more tears. We will be free from the presence of sin. God, we, we look forward to being with you forever. While you see fit to leave us here on this earth, we recognize that our job is to be your ambassador, to represent you. And so we pray that you would equip the saints to do that well. God, as we, like every other human, deal with the challenging circumstances in our life, with work and school, with family and finances, with health or challenges therein, God, may we be different and set apart from the world, set apart from our neighbors in that no matter the temperature, we have a smile on our face and joy in our heart because we give thanks in all things. And we're able to give thanks in all things because of the faith that you have given us to know that you are God, that you are on your throne, and that you are working all things together for your good and our glory. And so even as we look face to face with the difficult circumstances we have in our own lives, may we see those as coming from you, being allowed by you, accomplishing your purposes for sanctification in our life, realizing that as we deal with trials and tribulations by faith, that others around us are noticing that you have made us different. And you draw them to yourself through our testimony, through us shedding the light of the gospel, even though we are jars of clay, broken, frail, fragile, leaky, imperfect. You are using us to draw men and women, boys and girls, to yourself through our lives as our lives testify to the good news that Jesus saves that Jesus makes a difference in life, allowing one to give thanks for a flat tire even, or this circumstance or that. So God, as your people, uh, we worship you by trusting you. We worship you by placing our requests at your feet. As you read the hearts and minds of every person here this morning, you know what is important to them today. And we as your people are offering those things up to you, asking you to intervene and to act in a mighty, powerful way. Show yourself mighty on our behalf. Let people see how good you are through how you deal with us. And as you deal kindly with us, may we be careful to give you all the praise. May we be careful to give you all the credit, all the glory, so that when people speak to us, we quickly turn their attention off of us and onto you, the Savior of the world. We pray that you would use us to be a light in a dark place, to bring hope where it seems to be hopeless, to point people to Christ. We pray that Christ would be lifted on high through the preaching of your word even now. We're thankful. Pastor Craig, for the work and time he's put in this week in preparation. We pray that you'd fill him with your spirit and us the same. That he would communicate through the spirit, that we would receive through the spirit and hear your truth. That you would change us, transform us through your truth to be more like 
your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, please go ahead and take your Bibles out, and let's open up to Genesis chapter 27. Genesis chapter 27. <clears throat> Have you ever done something uh, and believed that you were perhaps doing it for the right reasons? Uh, perhaps you thought you had the right motivation, but uh, as you went through it and uh, the methods that you used to attain uh, the, what you were trying to obtain uh, were questionable and perhaps even wrong. Uh, perhaps sinful. Uh, maybe you've heard the expression before, the end justifies the means. Uh, and this speaks to the idea that any action or activity uh, is worth doing as long as you achieve the desired result, uh, as long as you get what it is you're looking to achieve. For example, uh, someone may justify, uh, you know, exaggerating the truth, uh, which we all know is what? lying, uh, but someone may justify lying or exaggerating something on an uh, application uh, or in an interview process because they truly desire to get this job that they are uh, applying for. Um, it, it can happen across, you know, all across life. Think of the sporting world and athletes who may uh, justify taking performance-enhancing drugs because they want to gain an advantage because they, their whole life they've been working on trying to achieve, achieve this goal uh, or, or this award or something and to be uh, receiving recognition for the things that they are doing. Uh, you know, I think we often see this in the political world, right, where uh, candidates are running a, a campaign or an election and there's possibly lies being told uh, to either smear the opponent's reputation, right, or to bolster their own reputation. And uh, I think all too often we, we just, I see all the heads nodding, I think there's too many who are willing to do these types of things and uh, to do whatever it takes as long as they get what it is they are desiring to happen. And so in today's text, we're actually going to see a little bit of this going on. Uh, but by way of review, let's remember where we've been. Since chapter 12, we have been looking uh, at the historical account of the patriarchs, right? The biblical patriarchs is who I'm talking about. And that speaks of the line of men that God used uh, to establish the nation of Israel. Think about Abraham, right? That's, that's where we begin with the patriarchs. We think of Abraham. And through Abraham, remember, God gave a covenant to be with him to make him a great name. And to make him, in fact, uh, a multitude of nations. Remember, his, his name means father of many nations or father of a multitude. And so with Abraham, we have the beginning of the Hebrew nation. This is where the Hebrews began, is with, is with Abraham. And so we know that uh, through his son Isaac, um, you know, Abraham's seed will, will come all these uh, promises of God to fruition. And Isaac, therefore, is the next patriarch. And that's who we've been looking at uh, more recently in our text. And in Isaac, we have witnessed how, uh, remember, he has been walking in his father's footsteps. We have seen that he's been faithful and obedient, just like his father before him. But he's also uh, struggled, right? And, and we've seen the sinfulness and the struggles and the fear that Isaac has had also, just like, uh, just like his father Abraham. Uh, we've seen how Isaac and Rebekah have had twin boys now. Remember Esau and Jacob? And we've been looking at uh, the events uh, un unfolding in their lives. We've seen the enmity. Uh, that has been between these two, even in the womb. Remember, as in the womb, they were struggling with one another. And God told her how you have two nations growing in your womb and two people groups uh, who are going to be against each other. And God told her, remember, that the uh, older will serve the younger, right? That the younger will be the greater. And because we know God has intended not for Esau, but for Jacob to be the next in the line of the patriarchs. And so our focus is going to continue to shift into Jacob. And then, uh, spoiler alert, but if you know how the rest of this, uh, you know, narrative of Genesis goes, we see that Jacob's name will be changed to what? To Israel. He will have 12 sons who become patriarchs in their own right, right? They become the patriarchs of the 12 tribes of the beginning of the, of the birth of the nation of Israel. And so uh, that's what I mean when we speak to this historical patriarchy uh, uh, of the scriptures that we see in Genesis. But for now, we're still looking at the life of Isaac and Rebekah and their sons, Jacob and Esau. And so we pick up that narrative here this morning uh, in verse 1 of chapter 27. And I'm going to read down through, uh, chap uh, not chapter 17, but through verse 17. Uh, so go ahead and follow along with me, please. Verse 1 says, Now it came about when Isaac was old and his eyes were too dim to see 
that he called his older son Esau and said to him, my son. And he said to him, here I am. Isaac said, behold now, I am old and I do not know the day of my death. Now then, please take your gear and your quiver and your bow and go out to the field and hunt for game for me and prepare a savory dish for me as I love and bring it to me that I may eat so that my soul may bless you before I die. Rebekah was listening while Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for game to bring home, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, Behold, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau, saying, Bring me some game and prepare a savory dish for me, that I may eat and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Verse 8, Now therefore, my son, listen to me as I command you. Go now uh, to the flock and bring me two choice young goats from there that I may prepare them as a savory dish for your father, such as he loves. Then you shall bring it to your father, that he may eat, so that he may bless you before his death. Jacob answered his mother, Rebekah, Behold, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel feel me. Then I will be as a deceiver. Interesting, right? Remember, Jacob's name means deceiver. Uh, In his sight. And I will bring upon myself a curse and not a blessing. Verse 13. But his mother said to him, Your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go, get them for me. So he went and got them and brought them to his mother. And his mother made savory food such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took uh, the best garments of Esau, her older son, which were in her with the house, in the house with her, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And she put the skins of the young goats on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. She also gave the savory food and the bread which she had made to her son, Jacob. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for this text. Thank you so much for the blessing of your word. What a blessing it is, God, that you have chosen to reveal yourself to us, that you reveal the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ to us. And and through this entire uh, book that you have given us, God, we we learn who you are because you have revealed yourself to us. So God, I pray that you would uh, deepen that well in us this morning, that you would grant us greater revelation, that we would have a deeper knowledge and understanding and wisdom of, of your word and of your ways so that we may go out and be a greater light for you, that we would look more like you, that we'd be better ambassadors for you, which you call us to do. And so, Lord, I pray for uh, your church here this morning, that, that it would be edified, that we would be encouraged to go out there and to fight the good fight and to live a life worthy of the gospel by which we've been saved. And Lord, as always, I pray if anyone would be here this morning or listening uh, on Facebook or wherever these recordings go, uh, Lord, and they hear the gospel, that you would open eyes, that you would open ears to hear, and uh, that today would be the day of salvation for them. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the title of today's sermon is Purposing and Plotting. And in chapter 27, uh, you can look ahead and see it's, it's a pretty long chapter. We've got 46 verses. And so in this chapter, we are going to see as these events unfold, we're going to uh, see each member of the household's reaction, if you will. So this morning, I want us to focus on dad and mom. So the first thing uh, we're going to look at is Isaac's purpose. Then we're going to look at Rebecca's plot. Okay, so that's kind of going to be our, our roadmap, if you will, for the sermon this morning. So let's go ahead and get in with the first heading, which is Isaac's purpose. Verse 1 tells us that Isaac was old and his eyes were too dim to see. And so that begs the question, how old is he at this point? How old is Isaac? Uh, and so we know from the end, actually, the previous chapter, if you look up a line or two there in your, in your Bible, it says Esau was 40 years old when he got married. And so if Esau was 40 years old, uh, that makes Isaac 100, because if you remember, uh, when the twins were born, Isaac was 60. So 60 plus 40, pretty simple math so far, even I can follow that, right? So Isaac is 100 at that point. Uh, And we also will see that in the next few chapters, we're going to see a span of about 20 years uh, go by, okay? And then in chapter 35, we're going to find that Isaac dies at the age of 180. So all of that to say uh, that um, though we see Isaac believes he's about to die, he's going to live at least another 20 years, okay? And so at this point, I've got a, a range of 100 to 160, Okay, so he's somewhere in that time frame 
uh, old enough that he is nearing his death, old enough we see obviously that he is, is not able to see, that his eyes have gone bad as I look around the room. You know, I think uh, some of us who are, are already getting that feeling of our eyes growing dim and get, having to get reading glasses and all those things. Uh, but he is unable to, to see or see well at least at this point, and uh, he believes that he is close to death. We then see in verses 2 to 4 that he desires to eat of his favorite meal uh, and then to bless his favorite son before he dies. And so remember, we talked about that, the favoritism of, of mom's favorite and dad's favorite. And in this, we also see uh, that, that Isaac here, he responds and he reacts in the flesh. He, he reacts to according to his desires, that he is concerned here certainly about his appetite, right, to receive something that is pleasing uh, to him and to his flesh and to his desires. He's focusing on the temporal here rather than the eternal because we see that he seeks to desire which son, uh, to, to bless which son. Esau is who he desires to bless, but yet we know that, that God has chosen to bless Jacob. And so uh, we know that, that he knows this also. Uh, you know, I would believe that he knows this because doesn't Rebecca know that God has chosen to bless Jacob? She does. So I'm assuming that he also has the knowledge of this uh, knowing that God has chosen Jacob. And so he is choosing to react in a way uh, that is pleasing to him and the things that he wants to do. We will also see later in this narrative as we pick up next week that he's going to rely on his own uh, fallible senses. You we're going to see that he relies on touch and, and taste and smell uh, instead of relying upon spiritual understanding. Uh, and in that, I think we've got much application for us, right? To say uh, we are very susceptible to acting or reacting uh, in our emotional status, right? And according to our emotions and according to our feelings rather than from divine revelation. And if we do that, uh, that's going to tend to get us into trouble, okay? We, we want to react according to what God's Word says and not according to what we think or what we feel or how we uh, might feel about some certain thing. Uh, turn with me, if you would, please, to Joshua chapter 1. For some application here for us. Joshua chapter 1. <clears throat> Verse 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. Very similar words to Psalm 1, I think, of the first opening uh, book of Psalms there. So that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your ways prosperous, and then you will have success. So meditate on this book day and night. Does that leave out any time? That's saying constantly, continually, right? And encouraging us to do it often and all the time. And it says, then your ways will be made prosperous and you will have success. Uh, think of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 uh, that says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, right? But in all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths or He will make your path straight. Uh, so we will tend to get in trouble if we rely just within our own self because we still struggle in the flesh, right? And we spoke to that a lot in our study of Ephesians uh, this morning in, in Bible study. Uh, Romans 15.4 says, For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. So that's what this book is here for. We gain instruction as we're going through this uh, study of Genesis. We want to learn and we want to grow from these things. It's been revealed to us for a purpose, and, and we need to make good use of it. Uh, we see here if we live our lives, uh, you know, and make decisions according to our own desires and purposes, uh, and do not take God's word into consideration, then we too err, just as Isaac errs here and and, and tries to respond and initially reacts in his own. Uh, desires in the flesh. So we must walk by the Spirit. We must be guided uh, by the lamp and by the light, right, which is God's Word, according to Psalm 119. Allowing God's Word to influence our thoughts, our actions, our speech. Allowing God's Word to guide our paths, to guide our ways that we would follow those ways. So uh, back to our text, we see in verse 5, 
that Esau went to the field to hunt for game to bring home. So Esau obeys his father, which is a good thing, right? We've, we've had that application recently about children obey your parents uh, in the Lord, for this is right, this is pleasing and honoring to your parents, but also uh, to the Lord. However, we see that his father was acting out of his own desires and not God's desires and God's plans. And recall with me, actually, the scene back in chapter 25 where Esau was hungry. Remember what happened there? Esau went out. He came back famished. He said, oh, I'm so hungry. I'm going to die. Uh, and, and he sees his brother there making up a stew, right, making up some soup. And, and what did he do? Remember what happened there? I'm so hungry. What good is my birthright? Because Jacob says, yeah, I'll give you some of this stew that I've got here. Brother, you're hungry, but you give me your birthright. Remember that account? And so uh, Esau is deceived by Jacob, and he gives his birthright uh, to Jacob and, and gives up this inheritance and, and this spiritual blessing and such that we will see, uh, and he turns it over to his brother for a bowl of stew and, and gives it up. And so in that, you know, we saw that uh, Esau despised his birthright, is what it says in that, in that moment. And so I bring that up because we see here today the blessing. And while the birthright and the blessing are uh, not identical, they are different blessings, they do typically uh, go hand in hand. They are related, okay? They go together as part of the inheritance. Uh, Typically, it's customary that back in those times that the birthright was the one that was given to the eldest son. And the birthright had special privileges that came along with it. You were going to be the head of the household, but also there was a double portion blessing, which we'll see given in the law later, uh, that is given to the firstborn. And so he is going to be next in line to be the head of the house, and he receives double portion of all the other sons that receive inheritance. So this is a big deal uh, when it comes to just earthly inheritances, okay? And we see that Esau uh, now jumps at the opportunity here to renege and to go back on this oath that he made with his brother as he's trying to jump in line here now to receive this blessing. Because now that the birthright is going to Jacob, Jacob should rightfully receive this blessing. However, Isaac desires to bless his favorite son, Esau. Esau certainly desires to receive this blessing, probably in his own mind thinking, hey, I was deserving of the birthright and the blessing, and I was tricked out of getting the birthright. You see how we justify things? The blessing I deserve, and I should get this blessing, and my father desires to bless me, so of course he is obedient and jumps at the chance to go and to receive this blessing. However, in his despising of the birthright and any spiritual blessing that comes along with that, uh, this, this decision in this is final because we know that it is of, of God. And how we know that is because his word tells us. So if you would, please turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And again, just another amazing uh, way of how God orchestrates these things. I think I spoke to this last Monday night in Hebrews, but our Monday night Bible study, uh, men, we are in Hebrews chapter 12 right now and on these very verses. And so I, as I said to them, I was like, we have been preaching through the book of Genesis for, I think, 17 months or so, almost a year and a half. And the at our study of Hebrews has been about 10 or 11 months. So there's no way that Brian or I are smart enough to like make these things happen. And, and so again, you just see how amazing uh, God is as he orchestrates these things. And here we are with this text before us. Uh, Hebrews 12, let's look at verses 16 and 17. And so he's speaking of this root of bitterness here, the author of Hebrews, and, and it springs up and causes trouble, not to be defiled by this, and, and this root of bitterness not being uh, truth, but being false uh, teachings and false beliefs and, and all the things that we are without, uh, without Christ and outside of Christ. And verse 16 says, that there be no immoral or godless person like Esau, who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it with tears. And so we see that the rejection of God's covenant, the rejection of God's promises, the rejection of God's word comes with 
ultimate and severe consequences. Okay? And so we see that, that he longs for it with tears, uh, which we will see in the text also. Uh, but think of the warning. I think of these warnings that we s- we've seen throughout the book of Hebrews in our study, uh, just warning people of this, that this rejection is a serious thing, that you need to repent, that you need to turn, that you need to believe. Uh, I think of chapter 4 as he says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. That's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. That's what the writer of every letter in this book we have is saying, okay? In fact, that's what I'm saying. These warnings we give to people because they need to heed these warnings, right? You need to heed the warnings of the scriptures and understand the message of the gospel because, as Ephesians 2, 1 says, you were dead in your trespasses and your sins, that the picture that the Bible gives us is that all of mankind is depraved, as we spoke about this morning, that we are influenced solely by sin and the sinful nature that we have since Genesis 3. And so in our sin, it controls every aspect of our life, our mind, our emotion, our will, everything, our desires, everything we have is only sinful. And Romans 3 tells us that no one seeks God, right? No one understands, none are good, and no one seeks God. And so that's the bad news, that this is the state, the spiritual state of every single man, woman, boy, and girl that has ever been born and will ever be born, that they are alienated from God, and you are born that way, and you are a sinner. Anybody have a hard time understanding that about yourself? Well, if you do, I pray that today you'll be convicted of that. And that's the bad news. And the good news then is that the Bible says there is a way to rectify the situation, that there is a way to be reconciled unto God, as Paul says in the first letter to Corinth, because he sent Jesus, who took on flesh and blood, who lived a perfect life, therefore he was able to be a perfect sacrifice to pay for the sins of all those who would believe in him, and that he died, and he was buried, and he raised from the dead three days later, and in that it showed that he was victorious, and did what he said he claimed to do, and is who he claims to be, and that he conquered death, he conquered hell, he conquered Satan, and all the foes, and all the baggage, and all the things that hold us down. That we are no longer slaves to sin when we are in Christ, but we are now slaves to righteousness. We are now freed from the bondage of sin that ties us down. And there's only freedom in Jesus Christ. That's it. And so if you believe in this gospel, this good news, that he died to pay for your sins, and he reveals this to you, then you are therefore saved. You repent of your sins, you change your mind about that, you go away from that, and now your mind, your emotion, your will, all these things are being transformed and being changed because he has taken that heart of stone out, he has given you a heart of flesh, he has caused you to be born again, and now your desires line up with his desires. Now your will lines up with his will. Now you understand that you've been changed and you seek to do things now that you never thought that you would ever do before, right? Yes, amen, indeed. If that's your story, that's an amen. We praise God for that, that I am no longer who I once was, right? Think of the hymn that I was once lost and now I am found, right? I was blind, but now I see. Well, God is the one who takes those blinders off. Think of the picture of of Saul in Acts chapter 9, and it says that as scales fell off his eyes. Praise God that he lifted the scales off your eyes, And if he hasn't, I pray that today he would do that and open your eyes to the truth of the gospel that brings eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So let's go on to our our next and final heading this morning, which is Rebecca's Plot. And now before you get too excited, as I say, it's the last heading. Uh, It's like, hey, there's only a two-point sermon today. It's going to be a shorter sermon. Uh, As I see Brian smiling in excitement already, I do have, uh, just FYI, I do have 15 subheadings under this one. So... Uh, So you may be here still for a little while, uh, but obviously I'm kidding. But uh, as we come to this, though, there's so much points of application here today uh, that I find myself almost trying to speed through it to get to them. Uh, Let's look at verse 5. It tells us that Rebekah was listening while Isaac spoke to his son Esau. Now, it's not clear from the text uh, whether or not Rebekah happened to just be near him and was listening and overheard this conversation. Certainly that happens. Uh, And there are some commentators that believe that, but then there are others who side with uh, she was perhaps uh, intentionally 
uh, dropping an ear right to the conversation and, and hearing this and, and overheard this unawares to Isaac. And either way, regardless, it really doesn't matter, right? Uh, because in this, I just want us to see a lack of good communication uh, between husband and wife. We see a lack of Isaac uh, or Isaac's failure uh, of being a spiritual leader to his wife and to his family. Remember, we've seen the favoritism. We've seen the split in the household. Okay, so that's continued to be a problem. We don't see any open dialogue here, uh, and certainly we don't have everything revealed to us in the scriptures, and I understand that. Uh, but I think there's evidence to show that there's not much open dialogue happening uh, between Isaac and his wife in these matters. Uh, and this leads to problems that we see in the, final, in the family dynamics, which we've already seen and talked to some already. Um, you know, if we fail to adhere to God's purpose and God's design in the family, then we're going to struggle. We're going to have problems. And are there always going to be problems? Yeah, there's always going to be problems in marriage, right? In every relationship, because we bring our humanity into those relationships, right? Agree to understand. However, uh, there's going to be greater difficulties when we aren't you know, building our families and grounding them on the truth of the gospel and of God's principles. The family unit functions best when it is built on and when it adheres to God's design for the family. Okay? He is the one who designed the family. He's the one that started the family, Adam and Eve, right from the get-go. He's the one who defines, defines the roles uh, in the family, gender, male, female, he, uh, even to the, the husband, to the wife, to the children. He defines all the roles. He's the one who gives us the rules that we are to abide by. And so let's go look at some of them. Let's go over to Ephesians chapter 6. I know we all have these memorized and know them so well, right? And Ephesians 6, and we go to that all the time, and we should. And so we continue to do that now, and I, I'm uh, reminded now of Peter's words as he says, uh, remember that it is good for me to remind you of the things that you already know. And so that's what we continue to do here. Um, that repetition, remember, is a great teacher. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 22 to 25. Where am I? That's not correct. I should be in chapter 5. Would make more sense. I was in chapter 6, but there seems not to be those verses. <laughs> that is a typo. So we're in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 25. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands and everything. And I can already hear the husbands going, yeah, 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 right? Kind of elbowing, tapping your wife next to you. Yeah, well, here you go. Let's get back on, on, on track here and, and realize husbands, the higher calling, I believe, here to say in verse 25, husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. And I think verse 33, actually, if you look forward to that, says it well. Nevertheless, each individual among you is to love his own wife even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. And so in that, we see again that God designated the man as the head of the woman, as the spiritual leader of the family. And the picture that's given there is the picture of Christ and the church, right? And, and that marriage, and we talk about the marriage supper in, in Revelation. Uh, later in that. And so this is a picture of Christ being the head of the church. And so uh, I don't know that there's any greater responsibility or accountability. Uh, certainly we can talk about to, to elders, to the church, and the work that, that the commitment there and higher accountability for teachers and those things. Uh, but for all of us, th there's this high standard and high calling and great accountability that comes man, every man in here who may be a husband, every man in here who may be a father, uh, this is something that we are not to take lightly, okay, because of this. And so we are accountable, and you are accountable as a spiritual leader of your house. And that is something that you will be judged on one day. And so that's something to be mindful. Okay, so we see in verse 6 to 10 here, uh, back in our text, that Rebecca has a plan 
Okay, and she shares this plan now with her son Jacob to deceive her husband, right? To trick him and deceive him into, in fact, giving this blessing to Jacob rather than Esau. And we say, why, should, why would she do this? Why would she do such a thing to lie to her husband, to deceive her husband? And now she's inviting her child in to do this also. And so, uh, you know, I think back, if you look back to Genesis 25, let's go ahead and do that. Let's look back to Genesis chapter 25. It's only a couple pages over. And look at verse 22 and 23. So Genesis 25, verse 22 says, But the children struggled together within her. This is when they were still in the womb with her pregnancy. And she said, If it is so, why then is it this way? So she went to inquire of the Lord to find out what is happening here. Verse 23, The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples will be separated from your body. And one people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So in those verses right there, we might see what might be a motivation for mom to do this thing. She overhears, oh wait, my husband's about to bless the wrong son. And so I must intervene here. I must think of how am I going to make this happen because God said this is the way it's going to be. And I see a lot of nods right now, and I, as I even say that, you already see where we're going, right? That if God says that's the way it's going to be, then I probably don't need to jump in and intervene to make it so. And when I do, I'm probably going to mess things up for myself and for others around me, right? Because God's will is sovereign, and it will uh, be done. But I think she recalls this, and she remembers this, and apparently, again, thinking that God needs our help, right? I think actually several months back, I think I had a sermon title called Helping God. And, and it was Abraham and, Ish, Abraham and uh, Hagar. Remember that whole thing? And, and remember how Abraham and Sarah thought they were going to help God because, God, you haven't given us this child yet, and it's been uh, 20-something years now, and we need to have a child. I think at that point it was only like 10 years or so, but it was still a long time, right? And so they came up with a plan to help God. How did that go? How did that turn out? Not very good for them, right? And not very good for the situation. Did God still accomplish his will through that? He, yes, he still accomplished his will through that. And so uh, we've got to remember that, that they were growing impatient. Well, we need to also remember uh, that we can be impatient. And so we need to be patient. We need to, to wait upon the Lord and for his timing and all these things, not acting in our own power, uh, but rather uh, responding in faith and reacting in faith. And that's what we see uh, can be a problem for us, okay? And I mentioned this actually at the, the beginning of, uh, of the sermon in the introduction. I mentioned the in justifying the means, uh, which speaks to us getting this desired outcome we want, right? At no matter what the cost, uh, even though it might not be good things that we are doing. So Rebecca knows that God said this. And in her anxiety, right, she reacts, in her fear, in her anxiety, she responds and takes matters into her own hands and showing a lack of faith. <coughs> Excuse me. Turn over with me to Philippians chapter 4. And I know some of you were already there before me, knowing that as we talk about fear, as we talk about anxiety, where is our go-to uh, scripture for that, it seems, and there are several of them, but Philippians 4 is definitely a good one, and so we tend to use this verse a lot. Uh, and it's because, uh, why would we tend to go to verses like this a lot? Probably because we often find ourselves having anxiety and having fear and worrying about things and worrying about, God, what are you doing in this situation? God, why are you allowing for these things to happen? Let's look at verses 4 to 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. When was that? Oh, always. And again I say, rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Circle, underline, highlight. Let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, Anyone here desiring that this morning? 
that will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Yeah, why would we be desiring that? Well, are you here this morning? Do you struggle with anxiety? Are you struggling with anxiety right now? Do you struggle with worrying and being stressed out about the things in life? Well, take heed to these words here that we're reading from Paul, from the Holy Spirit, saying, be anxious for nothing, for nothing, right? You know what that Greek word nothing means right there? It means nothing. Yeah. You know what the word everything means? It means everything. It means in all things, seek God and, and seek him in all his ways. Uh, 1 Peter 5, 7, another bucket list one for this. Um, says to cast your anxieties upon him. And why? Because he cares for you. If you're a child of God, he loves you so much that that's why he saved you, to show his mercy, to show his grace. And he lavishes, as Paul says in Ephesians 1, he lavishes that grace upon us. John, uh, in the first chapter of his gospel, says grace upon grace. It's overwhelming right? It's overflowing. Uh, and so this is the kindness and the grace and the mercy and the love that God has for us as his children. He desires for us not to be anxious. He desires for us not to be stressful. He desires for us not to worry about the things of this life. He desires for us to rather do what? To have faith. To have faith in him, to be obedient to the things that he has called us to do, knowing that he is working all these things out in perfect accordance to his will, which is going to be for your good since you're one of his children, right? And so we've got to respond in that way and, and be in the spirit and not in the flesh. We must learn to be patient and wait upon him, knowing that his will will be accomplished. We know that, yes? Everything that he has designed and ordained and orchestrated comes to fruition, right? He, he's the alpha and the omega. He has written the end before the beginning, okay? And so he is the one who has all this to unfolding exactly how he wants it. And it, we need to be believing by faith that he does care for us and that he is working these things for us and for our good. Back to our text. We then see in verses 11 and 12, that Jacob questions his mother about this, you know, which is good. Like, oh, maybe this isn't the right thing to be doing. But look at how he does question. He doesn't really question her in regards to the morality of the plan. <laughs> he just questions, like, the effectiveness of the plan. Like, is this going to work? Uh, Mom, like, I think I'm with you on this, but the feasibility of it being successful, I'm not quite sure about it. As he says, uh, Esau is a hairy man. And we saw that even in his name in the birth that, uh, you know, his name uh, Esau means Edom or, or hairy or red, several meanings there. But he came out and he is a hairy man. Uh, and, he's, and he says about himself, Jacob, I am a smooth man. And so he's like, hey, dad's going to figure this out, right? Like this, this plan of yours, I'm with you, but it's, we got to devise a little better scheme. What are we going to do here? Uh, and so he, he understands that, that dad will notice that he is not Esau. And look at the fear he has in that also, which he should, because he realizes, hey, I might get caught in this. He understands there's consequences to this. If dad finds this out, not only will I not probably receive the blessing, but I'm probably going to get cursed for this because this is not how I should be treating my father. And so as the instigator of this plan, because look at Rebecca's response. She replies and said, son, don't even worry about that. Let your curse be on me. Like, wow right? Like, wow, your curse be on me. Uh, be careful what you wish for, right? Be, be careful what you ask for. So, but as the instigator, uh, you know, and the originator of this plan, uh, mom's prepared to accept, it seems, any consequences that come their way for this. And so that settles Jacob enough that we see he goes along with the plan. Uh, he puts on Esau's clothes, he puts these skins on, right? She puts the skins on his neck and on his hands, it says. And so that would be the skins of the goats because they would be, you know, furry. And so he would feel hairy as, as a hairy man, as Esau was. And then it says Rebekah gives him the meal to take to his father. Okay, and that's, uh, that's all we're going to have time for today to be continued next week. Uh, and the narrative will pick up and see the reactions and the responses of, of how that goes. 
But in our, in our text today, again, I just, as I studied through the week, I just saw so much application uh, for me. And so I pray that that's the same for you. Parents, uh, do not show partiality and favoritism, right? And things that will cause disruption and division in the household. Uh, fathers, do not take lightly the responsibility that has been placed upon your shoulders as husband, as father, that you are the spiritual leader, right? The priest, if you will, of your household, okay? Husband and wives, uh, do not lie to one another. Do not deceive one another and trick one another. And that's not one just for husbands and wives. That's one for everybody, right? Uh, we, we are not to be deceiving uh, one another and to be lying to one another, uh, even if we think that God's plan would be that this comes to fruition. Do we see it? God's not the one speaking to us and telling me what's going to happen. Yes, we have his word, but she had direct revelation from God saying, this is what will happen with these two children. So she should not have doubted that that was going to happen and try to intervene here and try to, to make this thing happen. So be mindful of how we should treat one another with love, with respect, right? How the scriptures call us to, to react to one another and how to treat one another, uh, especially if we're brothers and sisters in Christ. Christ loves Pete, so I should love Pete. And, and he says to love one another as I have loved you. That's amazing. That's much more than when he says, uh, love your neighbor as yourself. Even there, as we looked at Ephesians, it said, husbands, love your wives as yourselves. Why would he say that? Because I don't have any problem loving myself. I'm an awesome guy. I'm cool. I'm great. I love me very much. But I struggle with loving my wife that much. Do you see that? That's how selfish we are. And there again is the depravity and the weight of sin. That I am still, I'm changed by God, but I'm still so prideful and still so arrogant, still so in the flesh that I'm going to have trouble loving my wife as much as I love myself. That's what that's saying. And so we're not called to love others like we love ourselves. We're called to love one another as Christ loved me. <laughs> that's a whole nother level, you guys. So that's how we're to respond. That's how we're to treat one another. And remembering in it all that God doesn't need our help being God. <laughs> okay? He's got this God thing figured out pretty well. <laughs> Okay, he, he does a pretty good job at it, uh, and he's quite good at it, and so we don't need to jump in and think that we need to do that. Uh, God doesn't desire our help. He desires our obedience. He doesn't desire for us to be anxious. He desires for us to be faithful. And so let us do as the scriptures say, uh, you know, be mindful of him who is faithful, right? Be obedient to him knowing who he who is promised is faithful. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for this time uh, with your people as we gather together as brothers and sisters. Thank you so much for that amazing gift that we are family, and we are only family because of you and because of your great love for us. Think of Paul again in, in the letter to Ephesians as he speaks of children of darkness, children of disobedience that we once were. We were once blinded in the darkness of our sin and lost and alienated from you. But you have called us out of that darkness and into your marvelous light that we would be no longer children of disobedience but children of obedience. That we would no longer be children of wrath but children of grace. That we would no longer be children of the dark but we are children of the light because you have chosen to shine the light of the gospel upon us. And I know that your scripture tells us that those who are in the world have been darkened by the God of this world, that he has deceived them and that they are blinded from the light, that they are living in darkness. And God, we know that that was once us, and so we are so thankful and we give you thanks for revealing this truth to us. So God, as you've done in us, we ask that you would do in others. God, we pray that you would use us. I think of Paul's words again in 1 Corinthians, calling us to be ambassadors for you and that you are pleading with people through us to be reconciled unto God. So God, would you please continue to equip us, continue to grant us understanding of your ways, continue to uh, lead us by your spirit, continue to 
strengthen us to be more obedient, that we would spur one another on into to love and to good deeds, that we would hold each other accountable uh, to the things in your word, that we would live according to them, so that we would be able to go out in this community and, sh- and shine the light of the truth in this place. That you would be gracious, God, and do what only you could do. Drag people out of the darkness. That when they would no longer live in sin and under that sin and be slaves to that, God, that they would be freed from the bondage of sin and from this world and have eternal life, which we look forward to. And the glorious day in which that will be, Lord, as we sing of, as we think of, as we speak of all the time. We look forward to that day with great anticipation. But, Lord, until that time, we know that we have our marching orders, and we know that you have called us to go out to be salt and light in this world, that you have called us to go and share the gospel with all those around us. So, God, I pray that you would strengthen us to be bold as we do that, as we see a world that is growing in darkness around us and is so need of the light. God, would you shine that light through this little church and this little island and this little place we call the Florida Keys. For your glory and for your purpose, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our closing benediction comes this morning from Hebrews chapter 13. It says, Now the God of peace, who brought you up from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing, to do His will, working in us that which is pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. God bless you. Have a great day.